What's up and welcome to Gifted Afflictive. My name is Jackie and today we're doing Meth Culture. This will be a series. I will break it down into small, easily digestible pieces because if I was to sit down and talk about meth culture, it would go on forever. forever. So this is based off my own experience. I had a period of time where I lived on the West Coast. I was born and raised in the Midwest and that in of itself was a big culture shift, but on the West Coast where I ended up, a very small town, and I was used to living in a city that was, yeah, it was, a lot of people think of the Midwest and they think of like Kansas, like fields and fields of corn. And that was definitely the perception out. Um, I'm not gonna say exactly where I lived. I'm not comfortable with that. So I'll just say the West Coast. On the West Coast, they were very much stereotyping me as like this farm person, <laughs> like raised in cornfields. I was definitely more of a city person. I was raised in the suburbs, but I I gravitated more to, towards the urban parts of the city because that's where the good shit was. So I would go down to the, I would go to the ghetto, pick up the good shit, and then go sell it out in the suburbs. And that was sort of like what I did uh, to support my own habit. So when I was using, I was using a wide assortment of drugs and where I was living before I moved to the West Coast, finding um, drugs was not an issue. I was finding everything from weed, from weed to ecstasy. The mushrooms, the painkillers, to harder stuff, Oxycontin. Um, I was not a big downers person, so I, I did drink and I did use pain pills and I did use Xanax and I did use Oxycontin and I did use things like that. But my primary drug of choice was cocaine. And, you know, whenever I felt too up, I would take downers. And so I was always sort of playing this game of like being my own doctor, prescribing myself what I thought I needed to feel better. And why this is relevant is because being uh, experimenting with all these different drugs it made me realize that every drug has its own like subculture and meth was no exception. I started to notice the differences in meth culture were pretty drastic compared to other drugs. I ended up out in a state where I knew no one. And then when I was out there, I was out there for, I want to say around two years. And the city I was staying in was just this rundown, um, really, really small town. And the drug of choice was meth. <laughs> and I tried so hard to get any other drug I could. And I ended up I eventually settling on getting an assortment of painkillers, weed, alcohol, specifically vodka, and meth. And those are the substances I took every day. But I noticed that this meth culture was so different than any other drug culture I'd ever been in. And one of the main differences was the people that used, the people that used meth. And this is just my experience. There may be a good meth culture out there somewhere. I highly doubt it. There may be like good hearted meth users out there with good intentions and they just use recreationally. I didn't ever meet those people, so that wasn't my experience. Um, my experience was the meth users that I encountered were morally bankrupt and they did not show remorse or empathy very rarely. Very low standard of living, very low uh, moral standard, if at all. If they had some sort of moral compass, it was well on its way to being eroded the more meth they consumed. So I could visibly see this and feel this in the culture. I <laughs> became morally bankrupt as I consumed the drug. I noticed it within myself as well. I was doing things like breaking into houses, robbing businesses, um, robbing people, uh, even people that I knew. So this wasn't like, I was exempt from these things. I experienced these things as well. The people, they came with smiling faces, they welcomed you in, but they were the type of people that would steal your lighter and then help you look for it. You know, it's like very petty type of stuff. 
yet at the same time it just produced this level of distrust and like you were completely on your own even though you were all in the same world of like drug use and crime you were alone and that was very very clear like when i was using cocaine weed ecstasy mushrooms wet when i was using all of those drugs and i was still in the midwest my using friends were had an intervention for me would you like to go first class? This is ridiculous! What is going on in here? We get crack at the end? So they cared enough to like step in and be like, look, I think you have a problem. We don't want to see you do this anymore. And when I was on the West Coast, n well, my employer had an intervention for me, but nobody in like my using circles, my friends, Mm -mm. There was no intervention. It was more like if my body ended up on the side of the road, they would help you bury it. That was meth culture. Okay, so a few other examples of these friends that I had in the meth world. Um, these are the type of friends that will invite you over to their house and while you're getting fucked up, they're siphoning the gas out of your tank. Okay. Okay, so... You go over to people's houses and you don't know, are they a friend or are they just pretending to be a friend so they can get something out of you? This is not uncommon to other drug cultures. There is a lot of using that goes on, but just the degree of like brashness and like just blatant disrespect that goes on in the meth culture was to me, it was like very hard to wrap my mind around. I'm natural. I'm naturally a loyal person. I'm naturally the type of person that I would rather run in a small circle and be able to trust everybody in that circle that they do what they say they're going to do versus have this wide circle of people that puts me at a higher risk. But it seemed like in the meth world, even if I tried to run in a small circle, maybe four out of five people in this circle would turn on me regardless of if I remain loyal to them to a fault, they would still fucking try to steal my car, siphon gas out of the tank, um, these sort of things. And the rationale would be when caught, oh, well, I thought you'd be cool with it because the car was already stolen, so I'm just borrowing it like you borrowed it. Or the gas, well, I thought you'd be okay with it because I needed to go so I could get us some more shit, that type of thing. It's like, why not just ask me, you know? There was, there was very little being straightforward and straight up, and it was more conniving, plotting, doing things behind your back, all that. The last and final point for this video today is relentless. Oh, Bella. There was this relentless feeling of desperation, urgency, and paranoia that was just underlying every moment of every day. Um, non-stop. It's the feeling of always having to look over your shoulder because you don't know who's coming for you, when they're coming for you, why they're coming for you. You just know that nobody is for you. It's basically you are for yourself, you are responsible for your own survival, and you're always having to be like on edge and hyper alert. And that's the nature of the drug too. It produces this like um, it's almost like everyday m emotions become exaggerated and amplified was my experience, like paranoia. Um, I was never the type to like smoke weed or coke. Yeah, coke did make me paranoid, but um, not to the degree that meth did. So like I could smoke weed and just chill and just be normal. Like it just kind of like mellowed me out, right? And then cocaine, it was like, I would be looking at my people like, are the police out there? I feel like the police are coming, you know? And so Coke did do that to me, but meth did it to me in an even more severe way of like, okay, everybody's out to get me. And I feel like by the end of the day, I might end up murdered because in meth culture, it wasn't uncommon for there to be people go missing, people just out of the blue end up in prison. There was a higher degree of snitches in meth culture than any other drug culture I experienced. But it's, 
it's this looking over the shoulder feeling because you live in a constant chaos of impulsive violence. And this is the norm in meth culture. It's a very violent and impulsive world. So you never feel settled or safe. And I was afraid to actually go to sleep. So this feeling would carry on 24 seven up to two weeks at a time. And then when I rested and woke up and I just had that that urge and that deep desire to use so bad, that's cravings, that I immediately started using the second I woke back up. And so this whole cycle repeated again. And a good example would be the dealers I visited. So dealers are dealing with the culture at a really extreme, um, they're like deep in the culture, right? Because they're the dealers. So one of my dealers had, um, in her office, it just had tons and tons of surveillance cameras. And she would just like sit there and just, just be looking at all, all looking at all the different monitors, just like waiting for something to pop off. Another dealer I visited regularly, like he, he, he always had his gun right within arm's reach and he had his monitors set up in his bedroom. Like his, um, there was cameras on the outside of the house, right? And so the monitors were in his bedroom and he would just, just smoke, watch, smoke, watch, smoke, watch. The second he saw something, he would grab his gun, charge out the front door. His kids are in the living room and he's just looking, he's looking. He's like wanting to get these intruders or these people that have trespassed or whatever it is that he saw them do on the monitor. Maybe they grabbed one of his things. Maybe they tried to grab one of his cars. I don't know what he was seeing on the monitor, but all I was seeing was there was nothing there. There was nobody there. Just his own kids traumatized in the living room. And then progressively, this just became so normal that we would pull up to the house and now his kids would come out and greet us with little like miniature toy versions of his exact guns. And so it was just like, this was meth culture. This was what my experience was with meth culture that I didn't experience this in any of the other drugs it was a very more dramatic desperation the people that used i wouldn't consider them bad people i would just consider like that they were slowly um eroding like on the inside their true selves their their um, potential to be great people was just slowly eroding with the more of the substance that they consumed and I just wanted to share that today because I feel like a lot of times um, people kind of just turn the blind eye to people that use drugs wh whatever reason they're like oh they're harmless like they're just they're just hurting themselves and all that but like no that was a not my experience in meth culture meth users myself included maybe i wasn't intentionally like having these uh maybe i wasn't consciously like having these really evil thoughts but the more i used that drug the more demented and evil and psychotic i became just over the the course of being surrounded by equally sick people and this produced a very um dangerous community and that was the same feeling of me like walking down the street carrying um a steel pipe or a knife or something in my hand all the time i felt like i had to have something to protect myself because i'm just out here right and i see people on the street out here where i live now and yeah they walk around with like a baseball bat or you know a gun or whatever because they just, you can tell they're on edge and you can tell they're in that like really non-trusting place. And when I see people carrying weapons on the street, I don't think they're carrying that for no reason. I think just like me, they were fucked over one too many times to where they feel like they have to carry something to protect them at all times. Because the, for me, it's sleeping. The minute I would close my eyes and go to sleep. Those are the moments when I was most vulnerable. Letting your guard down as a female 
if you go to sleep in the wrong house, you might end up somebody raping you or in my case, trying to rape me. I fortunately was able to get away, but that's not the case for everybody. And I know I was very lucky and I still to this day, I struggle with going to sleep at night because I know that now I go to bed relatively early, especially in the drug world. That's when things are sort of just getting started for the night. So I still struggle with like not having control over what goes on once I close my eyes and I still feel unsafe when I'm asleep. I feel vulnerable, right? That's something I'm still dealing with even seven years sober and I, just like my dealer, I sleep with a gun within arm's reach, yet I still don't feel safe. So I'm not sharing all of this to say to ostracize meth users, to judge anybody. That's not the purpose. The purpose is just to bring a little bit of a light on meth culture because I feel like if meth culture goes unaddressed, it's basically like this poison that runs through the community and a lot of meth culture is like very secretive and in part two I'll go more into like the secrecy of it, the codes, the mind games, uh, more of the paranoia, the heartlessness. So we'll continue in part two. Until then, I hope if you know anybody that's struggling with a drug addiction, you find it within yourself to treat them like a human, treat them as more than just their symptoms, show some compassion for them, even if, even if they are doing the most despicable things in your eyes. At the end of the day, they are still human. They deserve to be treated as such, and we can't really reach people to help them if we're up on our high horses judging them and talking down to them and lecturing them. So I was able thankfully to receive help from a couple good-hearted strangers and my brother and my mom and my dad but um, when I was out there it was total strangers that got me back to my family and um, I'm very thankful for that but I was only able to receive help when I was talked to like a person with compassion, uh, without judgment. So I encourage anybody that has a loved one that's still struggling to just let them know that you love and care about them and they can reach out to you when and if they're ever wanting to get help. Just having that option um, is very powerful when you're in the darkness, in the despair of your addiction. Sometimes it can feel like there is no light, but when my brother laid out that lifeline for me of look call me when when you want to get out and that opened up a little glimmer of light even though deep down I didn't ever really think I was going to be able to stop that little glimmer of hope was enough for me um, when I was ready and willing and able to I just went for it and I made sure that he was one of the first people that I reached out to and yeah for for that I'll always be for that <laughs> I'll forever be grateful. So that <laughs> that's it for today. Um thank you so much for watching and I will catch you guys in my next video. Peace.